morning and welcome to Move Ministries. We have made it to our seventh church. We will be completing the book of Revelation or the or the uh, first uh, three chapters. Are, I guess I have marbles in my mouth this morning. Churches. We're going to be, yes, finishing up the churches this morning. So um, we better just pray because that just seems like that kind of a morning. So let's have our heads in prayer. Oh, Lord. I will never get over the privilege we have in prayer to come to you and to just bring our lives before you. You know so intimately of you, as you have showed us through these churches, you know us so intimately. You know where we live. You know what we are, are dealing with in our everyday lives, Lord. And you speak truth into that. Give us ears to hear your truth this morning. You've given us two ears to hear and one mouth to speak with. Let us hear, Lord, twice as much as we speak this morning. Let this offering be pleasing to you, Lord, and by the power of your spirit, lead and guide us into all truth that you might be praised. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let's get started on the seventh church in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And we'll begin um, by a little review. So make sure your Bibles are open and you're all set. So we have seven churches. That's not by accident. We know that seven is the number of completion and perfection in God's language. Uh, these churches represent the, the completed body of Christ. This, While this is first and foremost for the historical churches, this the, 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 the actual churches, um, that resided in Asia Minor. This is a message for the churches of today and not just the churches, the church as a whole, but it is for us as believers too. And it is for the building up of the body of Christ to do the work, to do kingdom work, to do the work of Christ. And so uh, let's just review our churches. So we had the church at Ephesus, which was our loveless church. They had forsaken their first love. The church at Smyrna, our persecuted church. The church at Pergamum was the tolerating church. They were tolerating sin within their midst. And then we had the church at Thyatira, which was the church that welcomed sin and encouraged their believers to remember that was when they were um, going into the guilds in the different in the different cities in the in the city to um, participate in the immorality. And then there was Sardis, the dead church. So we sort of see this downward progression. And then last time we were together, we had the church at Philadelphia, which I found such encouragement that they were not a perfect church, but they were a church that was pleasing to God. That was such an encouragement to me. And last we have our Laodicean church, which is the church that makes Jesus puke, that makes him vomit. And so uh, we will get into the church at Laodicea, chapter three, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit, more literally, vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, and be, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, bless the reading of your word. 
I feel like as we begin to understand the historical context of this, of this, the city, we will, it will open up our eyes and we will be able to understand why Jesus addresses this church as he does. All right, so this church was located just 40 miles from Philadelphia. It was located up on a high plateau, so it enjoyed safety and security. Its nearest neighbors was the city of Hierapolis and Colossae. We know Colossae from the, the letter to the Colossians. It was situated on a main trade route that led both to Pergamum and to Ephesus, so you could get west to the, the majority of the Roman Empire, but also east to, um, to the Orient. And so it was very well situated for success in commerce. There were a few things that this city was particularly known for. One was a booming textile industry. They produced everything from cloths to carpets that were exported all over the <clears throat> Roman Empire. They were particularly known for this black sort of glossy wool that they produced and they had a monopoly on this market there was no one else who could produce this black glossy wool as they could and so where did it come from was it from a dyeing process or was it from a particular you know breed of sheep they don't really know but it was incredibly unique it was very prized and it increased their wealth tremendously and subsequently any Laodicean, you know, if you were in, you know, the coolest of the cool, all wore this particular black garment, this black glossy wool, and with a great deal of pride. They were also the home to a major medical center that was attached to a temple, and the temple was to the Greek god of um, Asclepios, who was the uh, god of medicine and <clears throat> doctors. So this medical center was particularly known for an eye salve or an eye uh, compound or ointment that was famous throughout the Roman Empire. And so people would come to uh, Laodicea for this eye ointment and they would, and this ointment was also sent throughout the empire, it was known to heal just about every kind of eye problem except for blindness. And so this city, because of their, their medical facilities, was a very healthy city. They prided themselves on their, their physical well-being and their physical health, and it led to a great deal of, of pride in their own self-sufficiency. So also a very wealthy, wealthy city. They were known for their banks and for their financial uh, institutions. Think of like a, um, a New York City with, with Wall Street and, and, and lots of trading. They were known for their financial security, for their wealth. Um, their wealth was so great, in fact, that in 60 AD, there was an earthquake that absolutely flattened the city. Rome offered to send money and resources to Laodicea to help her rebuild. And she said, no, thanks. We can do it ourselves. And so they really got a name for themselves in, in that they were a self-built, they were self-made, and they were self-sufficient. And so uh, well, one of the major problems in Laodicea was her water supply. So she didn't have her own water supply, and so it came from two different sources. Colossae, one, um, they, they piped in water from Colossae, and Colossae's water was known for its cold, icy crispness. We were talking about um, how good ice-cold water tastes after uh, a workout, right? Um, and so it sort of revives you. And so water would be piped in from Colossae, but also from Hierapolis. Hierapolis had these hot springs. And if you've ever been to a hot spring, they're actually awesome. They're um, just really warm and really relaxing. And uh, the partic these particular hot springs were known for their medicinal purposes. They were full of all of these minerals that were known to have healing properties in Hierapolis. And so the water had to come into Laodicea through underground pipes because if it was above ground, it would be their water sources could easily be poisoned by uh, enemies. And so it was a way of, of protecting their water sources. But as the water traveled along through these pipes, what happened to the hot water? It's going to cool down, right? And what happens to the cold water is it's actually going to warm up, right? It's not going to maintain that that crispness. So their water came in lukewarm. That makes a lot of sense, right? 
but also the water because of all of the minerals coming in from the hot springs. You'll see this at the bottom of your um, of your worksheet that there's sort of this white um, residue that's on the bottom of these pipes and it's from those minerals. It would leave this, this sort of residue in the water. So their water was yucky tasting and yucky smelling. It's think, think of like swamp water. That was the water in Laodicea. And so this is a major problem. And so the city has a monopoly on textiles, right? They were very well dressed. They had a world renowned medical city and they had a thriving financial center, but they couldn't supply their city with drinkable water. And it is this city to which Jesus writes. Now, uh, Laodicea is actually mentioned elsewhere in the scriptures. It's mentioned in Colossians 2, 1 and in Colossians 4, 16. Uh, in, in Colossians, Paul is, is telling the Colossians church how much he desires for them and Laodicea to know the true wealth that comes from Jesus Christ. He says to Laodicea, uh, he says to the church at Colossae, he says, this letter that I've written to you also pass on to the church at Laodicea, but then read the letter that I have written to them. So what happened to the letter at Laodicea? It has been lost to history. We do not have it. But we do know that um, their letters were passed throughout these churches. And so Laodicea did, um, did read these letters that Paul wrote. Paul did visit the, the church at Laodicea and um, on his second visit to, um, on his second missionary journey. And so how does Jesus introduce himself to this church? It says in 14b, he introduces himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this. So he introduces himself first as the amen. What does this mean? So amen is kind of a cool word. We're so familiar with it, but it comes directly to us from Hebrew into Greek, into English without any translation. Amen is the Greek, is the Hebrew, Greek, and English word. We There's no translation to it. It is a covenant promise word. Amen is a strong, affirmation to truth. We need to be careful how we use the word amen because like I said, it is a it is a covenant word. It literally means yes, so be it, may it be so. It is affirming of the truth. So when he says, I am the amen, he is the fulfillment. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of every promise of truth that God has ever made. And he has never failed in any of those promises. Jesus Christ is the, the source of that truth. And therefore, as we move on to the rest of the book of Revelation, as Jesus Christ is the amen, we can be assured that what is to come is all true. Then he says, I am the faithful and true witness. So not only is he the source of the truth, everything that he says is true. And what is he a witness of? What is he a witness to? To everything that God has said, to everything that God has done. He has seen it all, he knows it all, and he testifies to that truth. And then he says, I am the beginning of the creation of God. Now this is a vital, doctrine that we need to know, that we need to be equipped with, and that we need to be prepared to teach and to preach on, okay? This is a doctrine that separates us from so-called Christian cults. There are Christian cults that will testify that Jesus Christ is a created being, and they will use verses like this. And it's a, it's a poor translation because when he says he is the beginning, it doesn't mean positionally that he's like the first in line, that he is the first of creation. No, that's not what it means. It means more accurately translated, he is the origin, he is the source, he is the initiator. Jesus Christ does not have a beginning because if he did, he would have an end. He is eternal. He was there in the beginning. He is not a created being. But there was a heresy that was being taught at Colossians, in, in at the church in Colossae, that Jesus Christ was a created being and it was wreaking havoc in that church and it was taking root at the church in, in Laodicea. This is why we need to be equipped with this truth. This is an essential doctrine. There are essential doctrines of our faith that are 
non-negotiable and we need to be equipped to defend those so that also so that we are not disillusioned but also so that we don't become like some of the other churches tolerating and even inviting false teaching into our churches so why does jesus introduce himself to this church at laodicea with these these very powerful very forceful titles he's really forcing this church to deal with what they believe he's he's challenging them and he's forcing them to wrestle with the amen with the truth and what they believe it's really a gift of of mercy and of and of grace that he's forcing them to deal with it and and really we should do the same with our with ourselves right do i believe him to be the amen is he the faithful and true witness and if i do believe that how do i live my life now knowing that truth if you know truth and you have been taught truth and you don't live by that truth you then subsequently will live a lie let's look at the condition of this church verse 15 i know your deeds you are neither cold nor hot I wish you were cold or hot. So just as we've talked about their water source, what was the temperature of their water source? Lukewarm. It was lukewarm. It was neither hot, where it would be calming and refreshing and healing, and nor was it cold, where it was freezing and, you know, um, the, the, hot, the cold would have been refreshing. You are lukewarm. Yuck. What is worse than lukewarm water? It is useless. What is a lukewarm believer? What is a lukewarm church? They're half-hearted. They're only skin deep. I thought of this particularly in um, the week that, that just passed. I think of Judas, who was just enough of a Christian, Christ follower, to be considered a disciple, but his heart was never in it. These are the people who maybe only show up to church on, at Christmas and at Easter. They have just enough of Jesus to be considered those who, who follow him, but their life isn't transformed by him. They're not regenerated. They're not transformed. There's no <laughs> sanctification in your life. If you are not growing in Christ, then you are dead in Christ. True believers grow they are those who think this this is a really good indication of where a believer is is by simply asking them how do you get to heaven well this is what a lukewarm believer might say well i get to heaven because you know a loving god wouldn't send anybody to hell well no he doesn't you choose that right well i'm going to go to heaven because you know i've done some pretty good things that's a lukewarm believer that's someone who does not understand the truth of biblical christianity and in my opinion i have found them to be the most difficult people to evangelize because they think that they're good they think that they've had enough and they don't know that they've been lulled to sleep by this lukewarm belief that they have and so what's the verdict that jesus gives to this church based on their condition verse 16. so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold i will spit you out of my mouth i will vomit you up it makes this the just as the water in this city made him made people nauseous and and it was vile so this church mirrored their city and it was the same thing there is this this group of people this church that was in this city and they were claiming the name of christ on their building and they were they were disgusting to God. And so you know, one of the things I thought is, I'm like, why is this church in his mouth? Well, kind of go back to that sort of truth that was coming out of his mouth. The, the truth should come out of the mouths of believers. And it wasn't God's truth, his truth. The amen should come out of our mouths. And it wasn't. And he says, I need to vomit you out. And so what other choice did Jesus have? I mean, this is really strong language. As my daughter was reading this yesterday, she looked at me and she's like, ooh, like, yikes. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's kind of what we should say about this church. It's scary. A theologian, Havner, wrote this about, um, about this church. The cause of Christ has been hurt more by Sunday morning bench warmers who pretend to love Christ 
who call him Lord, but do not his commands, than by all publicans and sinners. And I agree with that. It is those who, who pretend, it is those who think that they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and don't do any of his commands that are more harmful to the church. This is interesting. The name Laodicea literally means rule of the people. This was a democratic church. They voted, majority ruled. I'm always nervous when churches have church-wide votes, when it is ruled by a democracy, because it should be ruled by God. It should be ruled by those who have established and firm testimonies not by a majority rule because sometimes the majority the popular vote is not the right vote it's not the vote that lines up with scripture let's look at 17 and 18 the commands he gives to this church because you say this is their self-assessment i am rich and i have become wealthy and i have need of nothing you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so you may become rich, and white garments, so you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eye, so you may see. So they're in, in their own self-assessment, when they look at themselves, and usually when we do a self-assessment, we kind of compare ourselves with other people, right? Well, I'm doing better than her, or I'm doing better than them, or my house is bigger than theirs is, so I must be doing pretty good. In their own self-assessment, they were doing good, right? And if we looked at the city, we're like, wow, they're successful, they're healthy, they're healthy, wealthy, and wise in their own eyes. But the one who walks among his churches, walks among the intimate, the intimately among his churches, he saw, and I kind of go back to that, like the eyes, that his eyes of fire and that, you know, that like welder's blowtorch that knew exactly as he walked among his churches, what did he see? This is tough, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Can you imagine this church reading this letter? This is what Jesus sees when he walks among his churches. And I think, you know, maybe someone is coming to mind that you see as a lukewarm believer. How do we pray for a lukewarm believer? Because they say, you know what? I've got it, I got it made in the shade, right? We pray for them to have a need so deep that only Christ could meet that need, that they would see that there is a need there. They don't even, that lukewarm believer, there's, there's not cold water that's waking them up. There's not this hot, fiery passion for Christ, but that lukewarm that has just lulled them to sleep. Wake up, wake up here. So what is the command? And it's interesting as he tells them, you're poor, blind, and naked buy this from me. Well, what are they going to buy it with? He just told them that they are poor, blind, and naked. What is the currency with which they are going to use to purchase these things? It's not the currency of this world. That does them no good. What is the currency of the kingdom? I love this. It is said that the currency of the kingdom is faith. And that is what we purchase things from Christ with. It is that currency, the strong confident belief in the amen in the one who is the faithful and true witness and with that currency we buy unimaginable wealth incomparable wealth health and not a black glossy garment you know that is the the gucci of the of the moment but a fine white garment that has been purified by the blood of Christ. But I also see in this that we take the currency of this world and we, we surrender it to Christ to purchase things that advance the kingdom. Sometimes I think when people um, 
begin to follow Christ they think oh I need to get rid of all of my my earth surrender all of my earthly goods and and become poor in Christ well think about it like as Christians amass earthly um wealth a, a wealthy Christian who has surrendered that wealth to Christ and for his uses and purposes can do a lot of kingdom building if we surrender all of our earthly resources to worldly people we don't want that then they control all of the earthly resources so it's not that we need to surrender those things but we need our our the resources that god gives to us stewarded for kingdom purposes using what we have to build the kingdom of heaven the exhortation verse 19 those whom i love i reprove and discipline therefore be zealous and repent Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So what are they to do now, this poor, blind, wretched, naked, miserable church? Well, what do you want me to do now? This was a sharp and painful rebuke. But now, as Christ does everything with such love, those whom I love. It's interesting here. He does not use the word agape. It's not a, 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 a choice love. It is filio, that Greek word that means a brotherly love. It's an intimate love. It's a love of affection. So what are they supposed to do? He says, be zealous. That word zealous is the word hot. And it is the same word that he uses back up in verse 15 for hot. He wants them to repent with energy, with enthusiasm, with a zeal, with a heat. He wants them to be a hot church. Turn around, turn from your lukewarm ways and turn to me. Those whom God loves, he disciplines and he reproves. I don't think it's the, the discipline of God that needs to cause us such fear. I think it's when that discipline is lacking and when God has turned us over to our own desires and he has said fine have your own way it is in the discipline when we and and dis, we all know that discipline in the moment is not pleasant right but it leads to righteousness and therefore it is a good thing this discipline would lead to righteousness here's the second part he stands at the door and knocks and this breaks my heart every time where was christ in this church he's on the outside of this church and he's knocking on the door no one's opened the door no one even hears him no one even sees him no one even not one not one there's not a remnant in this church he is on the outside knocking on the door but there there's such grace and such beauty here too because because of how high and exalted he is the amen the true and faithful witness he still comes down stands at the door of this church he doesn't barge his way in he doesn't pound on the door he's not pounding he's knocking he's just knocking seeing if anyone will stop it's seeing if anyone will take heed to what is written to this church receive the blessing and open the door and let him in it's a blessing it's a blessing I wanted to share with you this this prayer that I pray there this this church was so filled with such self-sufficiency but there is this prayer that I pray and I and I do it one of two times the first time is um, when I'm like, oh, I I am up a creek without a paddle. Like I am in big trouble. If if God does not show up for me in this, I am I am lost. And the other times that I prayed this prayer is when I'm like, ooh, I think I could do this by myself. And there's this recognition of of self sufficiency, and I think, Lord, if I can do this by myself, I'm in big trouble. And here's how the prayer goes. Lord. And that's it. I call upon the name of the Lord. I recognize him as Lord over my life. And in 
just declaring him Lord. It is me saying to him, God, help me if I can do this by myself. But God, help me because I can't do this by myself. Self-sufficiency is such a danger to our modern church because aren't we fancy pants? Can't we do it all without the Holy Spirit? That's where we have found ourselves as a church and as a believer, right? Especially as Americans. We are wealthy, right? We can do it all by ourselves. And that is a terrifying place to be because you know where that puts Christ? On the outside. And he needs to knock on the door. God forbid that he is knocking on the door of our churches. Be zealous and repent that he may come in because this is so cool. Look what it says. If we open the door, what's he going to do? He's going to come in and dine with us. This dine that he's talking about is the, the final meal of the day. It is the, the supper. It's the family meal. And what he's saying is that the, the most intimate meal, I will come to you, into, I will come into your family and you will come into mine and we will enjoy this meal together. It's so, it's so precious and it's so sweet. What's the final promise he gives to this church? Verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he makes this church this incredible promise. They will share in the privilege and the authority to rule and reign beside the amen in his kingdom. That's quite the promise, isn't it? So what happened to the church at Laodicea? Well, this is somewhat good news. In 161 AD, one of their bishops was martyred. In 363 AD, there was a significant church council that was held in the church at Laodicea, the Laodicean council. So there is some evidence that they heard the knocking, that they opened the door and let Christ in. So we find ourselves at the end of these seven churches. Where historically are these seven churches? These actual historical seven churches are no more. And in fact, this area has been um, completely overrun to the point where there is about 2% of Christians left in the area. And so what, what is this? Why, why does this word exist for us today? Well, scripture teaches us that God's word is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training the man of God in righteousness that he may be equipped and complete for every good work. This word is for us. Every time you read scripture, you should be looking, am I being taught? Am I being corrected? Am I being rebuked? Am I being trained? And sometimes it's all of them, right? Sometimes it's a few of them. But that's what this, that is why this word exists for God's church today. May we have physical ears to listen, spiritual ears that actually hear what Christ is saying to his churches. Amen? Amen. We will be on break next week, so we will not have a live teaching on MOVE, but we will reconvene after that in two weeks to be in Revelation chapter 4, the throne room of God. So let's bow in a word of prayer to the Amen, to the true and faithful, witness to the beginning of God's creation. Lord, you are worthy, worthy, worthy of all praise. Father, anywhere in our hearts, in our walk with you that we are lukewarm, we ask for the fire of your Holy Spirit to cause us to zealously repent and turn, Lord, that we may be set aflame for you and for your name. Let us be the church that hears what God says to us.
Amen. See you in two weeks.